everybody, this is Tim, and welcome to Rock Essentials with Tim. Uh, very excited about today's show. Uh, we're going to feature an artist who I really love. He didn't live a whole long time, but his name was Graham Parsons. His mission in life was bringing authentic country music to rock and roll, or maybe it was bringing rock and roll music to country, uh, whichever. Graham's uniquely American musical vision played out like a Southern Gothic Shakespearean tragedy. And today we're going to explore some of the haunts and homes and secret locations uh, that I think uh, shaped Graham's career and ultimately change the uh, trajectory of music, all music, forever. So this is Joshua Tree National Park. We're about 150 miles out of Los Angeles. And uh, Grant Parsons, I think, loved this place more than anywhere else in the world. And, uh, you know, he wasn't exactly a household name, uh, so let me do a little backstory on him here for you. Graham was born into an extremely wealthy citrus plantation family. His parents died young uh, due to a plethora of alcohol-related problems, and Graham and his younger sisters were raised mainly by his stepfather, Bob Parsons, in Winter Haven, Florida. He was a headstrong teenager, and he was totally obsessed with Elvis Presley, and he played in a succession of rock and roll folk, uh, rhythm and blues bands at parties and keggers around Winter Haven, Florida. And by the way, some of his bandmates uh, were fairly noteworthy and went on to have extremely successful careers in music. But it wasn't until he finished high school and moved up to Boston to attend Harvard uh, that he heard Ray Charles' album, Modern Sounds in Country and Western Music, and his passion for country music really took hold. Graham became obsessed with artists like uh, George Jones and uh, Buck Owens, and for the rest of his life, uh, he took on an almost evangelical healer's fervor in his pursuit of it. So while he was at Harvard, Grant Parsons formed the International Submarine Band with some friends there, and they played Boston and New York for a year or so, and then they came out here to Los Angeles. Now one of the interesting things about Grant Parsons is he was what we would call a trust fund baby, and he received a stipend from his family of about $200,000, or what would equal about $200,000 a year now. We're on Sweetser Avenue in West Hollywood, and this building right here is called the Charlie, and it was built by Charlie Chaplin during the silent film era. And this is where Graham lived with his girlfriend and soon-to-be wife, Nancy Ross, while the rest of the band lived up in Laurel Canyon in a house that Graham actually subsidized for them. The International Submarine Band had secured a contract and a they'd actually done a record and uh, they were well on their way to creating what Graham called Cosmic American Music, which was basically straight up country with some rhythm and blues and psychedelia in there too. But the fact that Graham had all the perks that his trust fund could buy and his band was basically living hand to mouth, I think put a strain on the relationship to a point where they broke up. And this was kind of a theme that uh, ran throughout the rest of Graham's life too. But uh, anyways, uh, the Charlie Ray Day, 821. So after Graham left the International Submarine Band, he started jamming at some of the very plentiful country bars around the Los Angeles area. Uh, one was the Aces out in the uh, City of Industry, and the other was right here at the Palomino. And uh, we're on Lancashire Boulevard uh, in North Hollywood right now, and it's now a hall, but uh, check it out. This was a tough, gritty, hard scrabble honky tonk that didn't suffer fools or slumming rock and rollers. You had to bring your best Buck Owens or Don Rich or Merle Haggard riffs not to get your ass kicked here. Graham was only 21 and he credits fellow country music purist and Bird's bassist Chris Hillman for talking Roger McGuinn into taking him on. He actually joined the Birds under the pretense of being a jazz pianist. Now most people who are hired by the Birds to replace David Crosby would sit back and play and let the founding members of the group dictate direction, but not Graham Parsons. It wasn't long before he took over the reins of the group and persuaded the Birds, arguably the most successful American rock band up till then, to chuck it all and do a straight up country record. And that of course became Sweetheart of the Rodeo. So the only real way to say it is that this was one really weird album. 
and it was wildly unpopular at the time. And the only thing I could compare it to was uh, uh, the Iggy and the Stooges record. Uh, both had huge impacts on music, but at the time, almost no one listened to or especially bought the records. But anyways, right here, the Palomino. It's no secret that Graham Parsons was totally enamored with the Rolling Stones, and in particular, Keith Richards. Uh, the Stones were often in L.A., and Graham spent a lot of time together with Keith at various houses that they were renting, including this one in Laurel Canyon, owned at the time by Peter Tork from the Monkees and occupied by Stephen Stills. Uh, possibly because of the fact that he had his own little private trust fund, Graham Parsons was already an entitled rich musician. So it was almost natural that when he met rock star Keith Richards, they immediately fell in his inseparable kindred spirits. Keith had a thirst for American culture and its music, and Graham Parsons was an expert at both. So just six months after uh, joining the Birds, Graham played his last gig at the uh, Royal Albert Hall with them. The Birds were scheduled to fly out the next day to play a tour in South Africa, but Keith Richards had uh, put a bug in Graham's ear that because of apartheid, it was not a cool thing to do. Uh, so the next day when the birds were to leave for South Africa, Graham said he wasn't going, and that was that. He was yet again a free agent, even though Sweetheart of the Rodeo had yet to be released. You know, it doesn't take much imagination to see the influence that a guy like Graham Parsons had on a band, even like the Rolling Stones. Uh, just listen to uh, Let It Bleed, Love in Vain, or uh, Wild Horses, and it's pretty obvious. Henson Studios and before Elmo and the Cookie Monster took over this used to be A&M Records before that it was Charlie Chaplin Studios but uh, A&M Records was the home of the Flying Burrito Brothers. Gilded Palace of Sin was the first Burritos album and I think it may have been their best. The band itself was a mixture of pros and old friends. Bassist Chris Etheridge, pedal steel player Sneaky Pete Kleinow and original Birds drummer Michael Clark and most importantly, co-founder, co-writer, roommate, and almost total opposite in every way, Chris Hillman, who was kind of the yin to uh, Graham Parsons' yang. By their second album, Burrito Deluxe, Graham's substance abuse problems were starting to take a real toll, and Chris Hillman finally had had enough, and he fired Graham, and I can't say I blame him. If you've ever been in a band situation with someone who's more into getting high than showing up, or for that matter, making music. It's ridiculously frustrating and sometimes downright embarrassing. And soon enough, Ram moved on yet again. Right here, ain't it, right? So in the late 60s, early 70s, the LA traditional country music scene was mostly happening right here in the San Fernando Valley. And at this spot right here on Lancashire Boulevard was a really big part of that scene, and it was Nudie's Clothiers, right here. Nudie Cone was haberdasher to the country stars, uh, and his outrageous suits were immediately recognizable, and those who wore them were also immediately identified as being country music, and that's exactly what Graham Parsons wanted. So before the photo shoot for the burrito's first record, uh, Gilded Palace of Sin, uh, Graham took the entire band here to be fitted for outfits, custom outfits by Nudie, that they would wear for the photo shoot. I think Graham's Nudie suit says a lot about Graham Parsons at the time. The sleeves were embroidered with second alls and two and alls, which were a popular downer at the time, and there was uh, LSD cubes on it also, and the front was completely emblazoned with marijuana leaves. It certainly made a statement, and it took some balls to wear them. And as Graham was fond of saying, just because we wear sequin suits doesn't mean we think we're great. It means we think the sequins are great. It's right here, nudies. So uh, we're in the very heart of Hollywood. Uh, this right here is Cahuenga and Selma Avenue. And that right there used to be the location of Wally Hyder Studio 3. And a lot of classic bands recorded there. But right down the street here, about half the block down, uh, was a smaller, more intimate Wally Hyder 4. 
And Wally Hyder Four is where Graham Parsons did GP, and he did Grievous Angel here too. So we're going to check what's left of it out. By this time, the country rock genre that he had almost single-handedly invented with Chris Stoneman was starting to pass him by, and it bothered him to no end to watch his originality co-opted by more accessible bands like Poco and later the Eagles. But it was the impetus he needed to get back to work. He assembled a band that included guitarist James Burton, drummer Ronnie Tutt, and keyboardist Glenn Harden from Elvis Presley's band, and also featured his secret weapon on harmony vocals. If nothing else, we can thank Graham Parsons for introducing the world to Emmy Lou Harris. Graham has said that the key to the mind-blowing harmonies that he and Emmy Lou did was maintaining eye contact with each other. So, you know, a smile, a raise of the eyebrow, they'd know what to do. And if you don't think that a harmony can bring you to tears, then just listen to Love Hurts Sometimes, their duet. Right here, to Wally Hyder 2. way back up to Joshua Tree and I think it's important to preface what happened to Graham with an event that occurred to him about six weeks before his death and uh, he had a good friend named Clarence White and Clarence was a phenomenal guitar player as a matter of fact he ended up replacing Graham and the Birds but Clarence was like the Eddie Van Halen of Americana guitar players in the late 60s early 70s and uh, he actually invented the B-Bender guitar, which enabled you to play your telecast guitar kind of like a steel guitar, kind of sounded the same. And the way you did it was by uh, moving uh, the strap up and down, and it, it, it would trigger a spring. And uh, to this day, it's still used. As a matter of fact, Marty Stewart uh, still owns the very guitar. If you look him up, you'll see him playing it. So one night, as Clarence White was loading his equipment into his car after a gig in Palmdale, a uh, drunk driver tore through the parking lot, hit him, and it killed him. And much of the L.A. music community came to his funeral in Palmdale, including Graham and his manager and then best friend, Phil Kaufman. The funeral itself was a very traditional Catholic affair, very dry, little music, no testimonials. And Graham Parsons and Phil Kaufman very loudly made a pact with each other there that whoever went first would bring the other here to Joshua Tree, toast them with a few drinks, and send their ashes up to their maker. And uh, little did they know it wouldn't take real long before they'd have to make good on that pact. But anyways, right here, Joshua Tree. So by the early 70s, Grant Parsons was pretty much loaded all the time. Even Keith Richards was concerned with him, and if Keith is calling for your intervention, you just might have a problem. Graham loved whiling away the hours at these desert watering holes, and he had a real affinity for the locals that frequented them. Uh, once he even discovered one of his songs on the jukebox and played it incessantly, the fact that someone he never met would pay a quarter to hear him sing just pleased him to no end. Anyhow, when things got too sketchy, Graham would come out here to the desert to kick back and clean up, and clean up meant he'd cool it on the drugs, but hit the bottle all the harder. So on September 18, 1973, uh, Graham and his then girlfriend, Margaret Fisher, uh, spent their evening with a couple other friends, uh, drinking right here at this bar and uh, chasing it with the occasional pill, which is going to bring us to our next location. So after the uh, Copper Room drinking binge, uh, they ended up back here at the Joshua Tree Inn at Room 8. This was the rock and roll crowd's go-to hotel to stay in when they came to Joshua Tree. And before retiring for the night, they made a visit to Room 1, where Graham had earlier met someone and made a connection for what he thought would be a indulgent nightcap. Graham and his girlfriend Margaret shot morphine there and Graham being the ever, uh, I can handle just one more guy, uh, he went in for seconds and he almost immediately started to OD. They sobered him up somewhat with ice water and walked him back here to room eight. They threw him in the shower and laid him on this bed. His breathing had grown increasingly shallow and just 20 minutes later he was, uh, he was dead. So I've been told this mirror here is original to the room 
And I would imagine that it's the last time Graham would have seen himself right here. You know, a lot of accusations have been made about what happened here. You know, was it preventable? Whose fault it was? Uh, but uh, when everything's said and done, this was 100% Graham Parsons' fault. And it's just such a shame because the world lost such a great songwriter and artist in the prime of his career. Uh, so now we're back in Joshua Tree, and uh, this is where the story gets really weird. Uh, remember that pack that uh, Graham made with Phil Kaufman a little more than a month ago? Well, it was time to be paid in full on that promise, and it happened here. Graham's remains were packed off to Los Angeles International Airport, where they were to be flown to his stepfather in New Orleans. So Phil Kaufman and his accomplice, Michael Martin, loaded up an old borrowed hearse with beer and Jim Beam whiskey, and they went to work. They posed as undertakers and convinced the authorities at LAX to give them the body to transfer it to another airport. Uh, then they came back out here, stopped, and bought a five-gallon can of gas. They arrived here at Cap Rock totally drunk. They made a toast, they lit a match, and the coffin exploded into a, uh, a ghoulish fireball that could be seen for miles around. And almost immediately, uh, they saw headlights coming their way. They panicked. Uh, they left the remains here burning and took off. Ultimately, Kaufman and Martin were charged with stealing a coffin and fined. Uh, they couldn't be charged with stealing a body because no such law existed at the time. Macabre as it was, I kind of think Graham would have liked the way it all went down. Uh, he was a provocateur, and I think he would have reveled in the fact that things happened in such a unforgettable manner. Anyways, for Tim, I'd just like to thank you for hanging out with us. It has been an absolute thrill to bring you Graham Parsons from a place I love, like Joshua Tree right here. And if you haven't done it already, please subscribe to the channel. We've got a lot of other cool videos you might like. And I just want to leave you by saying uh, keep playing it and keep playing it loud. Peace out. Bye.